So staying with COVID, next to a journalist, shining more light on what went right during the pandemic. Greg Zuckerman is an investigative reporter with the Wall Street Journal. And his new book, A Shot to Save the World, takes us behind the scenes of years of groundbreaking research that paved the way for the mRNA vaccines that we have today. And here he is talking with Walter Isaacson about the little-known scientists who created them. Thank you, Christian. And Greg Zuckerman, welcome to the show. Great to be here. So a lot of people are afraid of this vaccine because it happened so fast. And it was this great miracle, as you describe in the book. But when you saw how fast it happened, did that reassure you or does that make you more uh, scared about this vaccine? Well, one of the goals of my book is to show that the evolution of these vaccine approaches, mRNA and the others I write about, uh, it's actually a really long and winding road going back decades. And in some ways, it's very reassuring. The scientists, the researchers, the investors, the executives spent literally years and years working and improving and honing these approaches. Um, it was not an overnight success, as one might think. They weren't sure these approaches were ready uh, on the eve of this great pandemic, but they had an inkling, they had a good idea and it turned out they were right. But I think in some ways it's very reassuring that it took decades, actually, not months or even uh, weeks to get these vaccines really done. The messenger RNA vaccine, the mRNA, which is Pfizer and Moderna, those are the big breakthroughs. Tell me about the early breakthroughs, including at the University of Pennsylvania, that helped people figure out how do you use a messenger strand of RNA to build a little protein in our body that will act as a vaccine? Sure. So mRNA is a molecule, and we all have it, and it sends a message to our cells to create proteins, which we depend on. We live uh, thanks to these proteins on a daily basis. So it made sense for scientists to say, well, what if in our lab we could create some of these mRNA molecules? So uh, going back decades, and I go back to 1990, where there's a really interesting and groundbreaking pioneering scientist named John Wolf uh, in Wisconsin, who does early work on creating these mRNA molecules in the lab. And it's always sort of been the uh, holy grail kind of thing uh, among some in the world of science. What if we created these mRNA molecules to create something like a, you could see it as your own factory, your own body becomes the factory, creating any kind of medicine or vaccine that you want. So, but they spent a long time on it. And as you suggest, first there was this John Wolf. Uh, he sort of passed the baton, as it were, to a group at Duke. And they in turn passed it to a couple of researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, a Greek and Weissman, who did groundbreaking stuff. And their work was really focused on getting this mRNA into the cell and not having the uh, cells, the bodies, uh, immune system fight it off. And that took up, was a process that really took years. And they did a lot of impressive work. The solid print really interesting work. And a lot of the goal of my book is to highlight um, some of this breakthrough, really impressive, uh, crucial work done by scientists over the years. And it took years and years to, to do it. And now mRNA mm -hmm. is on the threshold of both saving the world in terms of this, back, this uh, virus, but also potentially taking on other diseases. You mentioned the researchers at the University of Pennsylvania who do groundbreaking work to be able to get the messenger RNA into our cells and not be rejected. Corico, Weissman. But one of the interesting and controversial things in your book is they do not license their patent to Moderna. So what happens when a company like Moderna wants to make an mRNA vaccine and they can't get a patent? Yeah, it's a real challenge, and it was a real problem for Moderna. Here they have a great idea. They're in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They want to use these mRNA molecules, create them to send messages to the body, to create vaccines and drugs. And they can't because they can't get the license, can't get the intellectual property from UPenn. UPenn had licensed it elsewhere, and nothing really, frankly, ever came of that. So they were stuck, and it really came down to a really young scientist, one of their first hires uh, at Moderna, the guy who doesn't really get much um, credit at all. His name is Jason Trump, and he's laboring alone in the bowels of a laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he figures out his own way to modify the chemical um, basis of mRNA to make it such that the immune system doesn't reject it. 
and it's groundbreaking breakthrough stuff and he's never really gotten the credit and i shine a little light on it in the book but i think he should get a lot of thanks from us all uh your book is filled with colorful characters one of the minor characters i love though is uh i think juan andres uh who uh was helping Moderna manufacture the vaccine. We see him at the very beginning stockpiling toilet paper and at the end of the book crying. Tell me about him. Yeah, Juan Andres is a fascinating guy, really interesting, good guy, good-hearted guy. He runs manufacturing at Moderna. And in January of 2020, he started getting nervous. Both the things he read and his instincts kicked in. He'd been around the industry a little while. He's not a scientist, but he's in the drug business. And he started telling his personal family in suburban uh, Boston, hey, we have to start getting nervous. We have to start stocking up. He started buying toilet paper. He started buying paper towels. He um, bought a third, we're talking a third refrigerant. And his family thought he was insane. They thought he was nuts. They started laughing at him. What are you, crazy? And because we all had those instincts, right? Beginning of 2020. Well, yeah, there's something in China. But we've all seen what happened to MERS. We all saw what happened to SARS. They all kind of petered out. So won't this do the same? And his family thought it was the funniest thing in the world, and they were making fun of him, mocking him. Uh, but then, sadly, his own mother-in-law passed away of COVID about a month later. And um, they, like the rest of us, his family, started realizing the seriousness of this. And Juan Andres' heart is involved in this thing. And um, frankly, the people at Moderna, they all, many of them own shares. The shares have soared. They've made a lot of money. We all kind of say, oh, big pharma, and they're out for profit. These people have, have put their heart and soul into creating vaccines to save the world. And for as many people as they, they've saved, they beat themselves up about who they should have saved, how many more vaccines they could have made, how much more they could have done. And on the one hand, Juan Andres is very proud of what he's done, and he should be, but he feels he could have done more. So in some ways, they're emotionally shot, some of the people internally, and they're trying to uh, heal in some ways from this past year. And it's nonstop. And they're a, they were a relatively small company. Now they're a household name, but they weren't a year ago. So it's important to remember that. And um, I think to share some appreciation for some of the work that these people have done, including Juan. One of the heroes in your book is the guy at BioNTech who creates the vaccine that we now call the Pfizer vaccine in America because they're distributing it, but Ugar Sahin. And he's an interesting character. Tell me how he sort of becomes the winner in first getting mRNA to work as a vaccine. Yeah, Ugar Sahin is a fascinating guy, a lifelong cancer researcher, not really focused necessarily on diseases or like COVID, that kind of thing. He always believed in the body's immune system. He believed that there are ways to wake it up, to teach it, that maybe we haven't uh, approached in the past. And now he, he dedicated his life to that. And frankly, uh, he started this company called BioNTech. They weren't making that much progress um, on the surface to, to the outside world. But internally, they were getting more excited about their approaches, including mRNA. And he's just a really interesting guy. He lives uh, still with his wife who co-runs the company, who's also a cancer researcher. They live in a little apartment in Mainz, Germany. He bikes to work. He doesn't even own a car or a television. He goes on vacations and he lugs computers with him and, and scientific papers and brings them to the pool. And he, did, he needs that dedication. He demands that dedication from his own employees. He and Stefan Bensel uh, from uh, Moderna can be seen, and, and, and you would appreciate this, as a little bit Steve Jobs-like in that they demand a lot of dedication and there are quirky, interesting characters and sometimes genius results from that. And one has to thank both of those characters. As I look at all the characters in your book and I go through them and there's Kata Kariko of the University of Pennsylvania, Nubora Fayan who helped start Moderna, Stefan Bonsell as you talked about uh, as one of the leaders of Moderna and then uh, Ugar Sahin, well, you can see where I'm going with this. They're all immigrants. They're all fleeing oppression. And they all, uh, so many of them, almost every major character in your book, it seems, has come to the U.S. as an immigrant. Uh, why is that? It's a really great point. Um, they would argue that these vaccines needed to be made in America, or at least with the support of American investors, and they could not have been made elsewhere. So Ugar Sahin, a uh, Turkish uh, immigrant to Germany. He um, lives in Germany still. The company is German. And yet they did their IPO, their initial public offering in the United States. They got invest a lot of their key investment money from the United States. We in the United States still have the capital markets that 
biotech and other types of companies around the world turn to, depend on for crucial investment money. But I also think that the theme is a really important one to uh, remind us all of the, those achievers often are immigrants who come uh, to this country. They strive. They are hungry. They focus on education often. They um, are pretty impressive. And as you said, you see the same thing at, at Pfizer, too. The CEO, Albert Bourla, uh, the CEO of Pfizer, is also an immigrant to the United States time and time again within the companies of scientists I write about as well. It is really pretty striking and, and impressive, too. Now, the characters you talked about aren't all that famous or weren't before this happened. They weren't the premier research, and they weren't the big drug companies like Merck. One of the amazing things in your book is, why does Merck fail? Why do these unknown people succeed? Yeah, Walter, I think that's one of the most interesting, at least to me, uh, things from my book, in that you would have expected the vaccine giants to have been the ones to create these vaccines to save the world. And that's Merck, that's GSK, that's Sanofi. Pfizer wasn't a vaccine player. And these other companies, Moderna, BioNTech, this group in Oxford, um, th this group up in Boston that I write about that created the J&J &J vaccine, they were overlooked. They were sort of underappreciated, um, dismissed even by many in the world of science and, and elsewhere. And I think part of the reason is that vaccines until this past year were seen as sort of a loser business uh, in the world of pharma. Merck, um, they are a big company, and they weren't sure it was worth their while to chase a COVID vaccine. There were people I write about in my book who did want to chase it and focus on it. And historically, Merck is the vaccine giant. We depend on them from mumps and measles and other kinds of vaccines. So there were researchers within Merck who pushed the company and the executives and said, hey, we're Merck. We should be the ones to develop a COVID vaccine. But others in the company said, we are doing so well with cancer in some other areas, and they've really saved lives in other areas with cancer and drugs and such. So they didn't want to take their eye off the ball. They'd seen what happened in the past with MERS and with SARS and what it takes to, to get those vaccines made and how those viruses petered out. And so there were some people within Merck who said it wasn't worth their while. What did we learn from the attempt to create an AIDS vaccine? And by the way, why don't we have an AIDS vaccine? That's just a virus as well. Yeah. Uh, so I start my book off writing about the chase for an HIV vaccine. And I do so because it is instructive. We uh, have still never figured that one out. Uh, the world of science has seen frustration after frustration. But one of the uh, approaches that was developed to fight HIV and develop a, a vaccine is the adenovirus approach. And that is basically um, using a virus, a, a, a harmless virus, to um, ferry in genetic, genetic information to the body and to the cells and to teach the immune system to fight off. It, they were trying to do HIV. It didn't really work with HIV. Merck spent years on it. And I write about what happened there. It's kind of sad and, and, and it didn't work and actually even potentially harmed. But um, from that frustration came the, both the J&J &J and the AstraZeneca Oxford efforts, and those are successful, effective vaccines. It's a real lesson in some ways that um, scientific breakthroughs sometimes come from frustration. And getting back to your, your point, HIV is so much more challenging and harder than uh, other illnesses like, like, like COVID. We, we all obviously have concerns about COVID and uh, the horrors that it's brought. But HIV uh, as a disease, as a virus, it's changing all the time. And it changes from one person to the next. Um, and it, 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 our immune system needs so much help and it really has not been proven any way to, to help fight it off. But some of the, my, my heroes in, in my book are working on HIV and they're not giving up. And the perseverance and the, the resilience that, that um, they, they show is pretty impressive. So we're hoping... Over the next few years, maybe they can have some success there as well. How much credit should Operation Warp Speed, led by another immigrant, Mahmoud Slaoui, uh, under the Trump administration get for these vaccines having been created so quickly? I think we need to give a lot of credit to Operation Warp Speed. Uh, the Trump administration didn't do a great job uh, before Warp Speed in terms of initially reacting to the virus and its spread. One can argue that the rollout wasn't done um, flawlessly, um, both by the Trump administration, but also by the administration uh, at the beginning. Uh, but Operation Warp Speed funneled money 
quickly to a lot of the companies. It also um, it did all kinds of um, really important work that hasn't really been focused on in terms of logistics. You need a part. You're a manufacturing plant, Moderna in Massachusetts. There are parts you needed. They were able to close um, um, roads and, and ferry this kind of stuff and over bridges and commandeer kind of trucks and such and, and get the parts that were necessary. So Operation Warp Speed is really helpful. That said, sometimes, and I write about it uh, in the book, sometimes it also threw a wrench into the plans of some of these companies, set them back, made certain requirements, just like any bureaucracy. They're going to be bureaucratic uh, um, ways that they slow things down. And there's a reason why Pfizer, yeah, they sold money. They, I'm sorry, they sold vaccines to the government uh, through Operation Warp Speed, but they didn't take money to develop because they thought it would slow them down. And I don't think it's coincidence that Pfizer and BioNTech are the first companies to produce these vaccines. It helped them that they didn't take money from Operation Warp Speed. So net-net, Warp Speed was very helpful for all the vaccine makers, but there were times when it slowed things down. What was the thing that most surprised you in doing this book? Like the precarious way Moderna or Pfizer or BioNTech were and how close of a call they had? I was surprised that as recently as the spring and even early summer of 2020, it wasn't clear whether Moderna was going to be able to develop any vaccine whatsoever. They had the technology. They had the approach. They had produced a vaccine, but in terms of manufacturing enough of the, the, of the vaccines, the shots, they didn't have the money, and they were desperate for money, and they went else, everywhere. They went to the Gates Foundation. They went to nonprofits. Uh, they went to the government. No one gave them money, and they had to turn to Wall Street, which I kind of found interesting. You know, Big Bad Pharma um, linked up with Big Bad uh, Wall Street, and they raised so much money that they could finally produce these vaccines. So it could have gone any other way, and it, it was very uh, possible that Moderna would have, wouldn't have been the one uh, to produce these vaccines. You've written about Wall Street. You've written about hedge funds. You've written about government now. You've written about pharmaceuticals. Is our system a wacky one, or is it kind of a good one, where a small company like Moderna has to hustle for money, and maybe there's government supporting from basic research, and finally maybe they can go to Wall Street and get investors? Is that an efficient and good way to do things? Walter, it's a little bit like Churchill said about democracy. It's not the best system, but it speaks to all the others. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of investors out there, venture capital investors and others, small investors like you and I, who are ready to put money into companies with just on, on a promise, on a hope. There's a little company I write about called Novavax that I think is going to be coming out very soon with a really effective COVID vaccine. That stock was a dollar a share really recently, going into 2020, and yet there were some investors who believed. So capitalism does get some credit uh, for these COVID vaccines, and for all the criticism, we have to give some appreciation. Greg Zuckerman, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you all.